much. You guys are great storytellers. I mean, from the firefly to the iceberg and the, the peak in the body, and then to the bars of my cell phone, I mean, I'm, I get a pretty good picture. You guys are, you guys are doing a great job. Uh, thank you, Dr. Herbert. We appreciate that. Right now, we're tackling Parkinson's and with Dr. Zolek. Dr. Zolek. Thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here and have an opportunity to participate in this wonderful event. Thank you for inviting me to be here. So uh, Parkinson's disease um, has been around for some time, but before we'll tackle the subject, I have to uh, make this disclosure that is required by my institution, Mayo Clinic. Uh, back in 2004, I was a part of a team who discovered one of the genes for Parkinson's disease that I'm going to mention the name in my presentation, it's called LARC2. Uh, this uh, discovery was patented by the Mayo Clinic and successfully licensed, and Mayo Clinic received the payments for this discovery. I received uh, from 2004 $168 per year. So now <laughs> you know my, my guilt. So, uh, pa uh, Parkinson's disease has been initially described by Dr. Dr. James Parkinson a long time ago in 1817. Uh, here you see the church where uh, Dr. Parkinson was uh, actually baptized, married, and put to rest, I lay down. And then uh, you see the front page of his famous essay, Unshaking Palsy. He called uh, this disease shaking palsy, and later on the French physician, Dr. Charcot, renamed it uh, as Parkinson's disease. In the right uh, lower corner, you see the plaque, which is on the house that was rebuilt after the Second World War. The original house in which uh, Dr. James Parkinson lived uh, was bombed uh, during the Second World War. So this is a new house, but they have a commemorative uh, plaque there in London. So uh, Parkinson's disease uh, is a disorder of older people in general. Uh, there are exceptions. Uh, and is characterized by cardinal features that consist of bradykinesia, meaning slowness of movements, and Holly mentioned that her father was not able to move his leg when she saw him first uh, time uh, when she was in the college and noted her symptoms. So this is slowness of movements, bradykinesia. Patients with Parkinson's disease have resting tremor, very characteristic, called pill rolling tremor, and then they have stiffness of movements, a stiffness of muscles called rigidity, and they fall. Now, uh, they, the disease is also asymmetrical, and actually Holly pointed that, that his one leg was dragging, not both legs. So that is also a characteristic feature of uh, Parkinson's disease, typical classical Parkinson's disease. And these patients do respond to uh, levodopa therapy, which is a symptomatic treatment. When you first put the patients on this treatment, they are um, responsive and they feel better. Now, over the last uh, 15, 20 years, uh, uh, we recognize that the patients with Parkinson's disease have a plethora of other things that are actually masked by those important cardinal features. And those include sleep problems, autonomic problems, cognitive deficits, uh, fatigue, pain, and many others. Now, Parkinson's disease is, is a common disease. Uh, in the United States, probably at the present time, are around a million or a million and a half of people suffering from Parkinson's disease. Uh, this slide shows you that this disease will not go away. If we do nothing, there will be many more people. That curve on the top is for China, and in 2030, that uh, of prevalence of frequency of occurrence of Parkinson's disease in China will be, they will have about 5 million people with this illness. The fourth line from the top is for United States, as you can see, is also growing. Now, pathologically, Parkinson's disease is defined by the loss of neurons called dopaminergic, dopaminergic neurons in the certain part of the brain 
which in that cartoon on the left side, as you can see, this center is located deep in the brain, and it's called substantia niagara, or black spot. And on the right side, in the right upper corner, you see the brain specimen from the patient, the normal controls, and you can clearly see that black spot. When you look into the patient with Parkinson's disease, which is on the left side of the specimen, you see that depigmentation. This is, comes from the loss of neurons, loss of cells in this particular area. When one looks into the microscope, then see that uh, these neurons that survive, many of them are dead, when the pathologist has an opportunity to examine the brain, but some survive, and in those surviving neurons, those are inclusions, aggregates of the proteins, and those aggregates are called Lewy bodies. So it's a very characteristic feature of people who died of Parkinson's disease. But it's what interesting is, and why this is Dr. Schofner invited me here, that these neurons in this black spot, they are special. Uh, they uh, are a pacemaker machine for the brain to allow the brain to control the movements. And they fire very rapidly. So those like a heart uh, has a pacemaker, so heart beats the same, those neurons, they fire 200 times per second. Well, they have uh, enormous need for energy. And that comes from mitochondria. And this is why I'm here. This is why Dr. Schofner invited me, because those neurons have a very strict connection to mitochondria. They need lots of energy. Now, the progress in Parkinson's disease came over the last 15 years from the field of genetics. And as you can see, this table shows you 18 different genetic loci and different chromosomes uh, that mutations produce in these genes Parkinson's disease. Now, some of them listed in uh, kind of uh, lightish blue, those genes, the faults in these genes or mutations in these genes, produce abnormalities in functions of mitochondria. So however they are um, nuclear DNA, Dr. Schofner mentioned that mitochondria have two kinds of regulations. One is come from their own uh, DNA, very small, but then there is a nuclear DNA which also regulates the functions of mitochondria. And those genes, they do not uh, act directly on mitochondria, but they act through different pathways, through different mechanisms. But then those dysfunctions are by present in different, uh, in different pathways, how the cell operate, but they need all energy. And that energy, or, or, or not enough energy, or uh, faulty removal of the uh, used uh, mitochondria, those are coordinated by those genes. So faults in these genes produced mitochondrial dysfunction that finally led to their death and then Parkinson's disease. <laughs> and what is interesting, and that was already mentioned earlier, that mitochondria also are very sensitive to environmental toxins. And back at the same time when the genetics started, very important discoveries were made in, in Parkinson's disease field that the certain environmental toxins can also, uh, in, in, in high quantities, can impair those cells in that black spot. And the people, if exposed to these toxins, uh, actually develop Parkinsonism over the night. So we have right now, the, and again, those toxins are work on mitochondria. So the insult for majority of patients comes from two sides, from the environment and from the genetics. Previous speaker mentioned that not all genes have very powerful effect, like those I uh, had in the table. They are also the genes that they have small effects. They are also genes or variants in the genes, but they, are, they have protective effects. And the future will be to find out what those variants, how they work, which one are protective, which are, are 
uh, producing the disease and how they work environment to find how we can engineer this uh, for our uh, patients. So, and that actually comes, uh, this is exciting and mind-boggling uh, uh, project, but before I go to this, uh, what is the treatment for Parkinson's disease? Well, the exercise. Exercise is very important. Uh, it's only one treatment that can potentially slow down the progression of the illness. The other existing treatments are uh, treatments of symptomatic nature, uh, and we can help the patients with Parkinson's disease, but we still cannot cure them. For advanced disease, surgical options are available. But this is a, mi a mild buckling technology. Uh, actually, this year, Nobel Prize went to the Japanese uh, physician who actually find out how to produce induced pluripotent cells. This is a project that Mayo Clinic, Harvard University, Johns Hopkins <coughs> University, Columbia University, and University of Pennsylvania teamed up uh, under the leadership of NINDS. We had a grants together and we were involved in this uh, particular project. We take the piece of skin, three millimeters, very tiny piece of skin from the patients with this faulty genes. Then we, we produce a fibroblast culture. Uh, as you know, the fibroblasts generate all the time. The skin grows uh, all the time. Then from this fibroblast, we create induced pluripotent cells, the cells that have a fetal properties. But they do not come from the fetuses. They come from the adult human being with these faulty genes. And then we are able to create those dopaminergic cells, these neurons that are missing in Parkinson's disease. And recently, uh, we published the article that we, after creation of these dopaminergic cells, we expose them to the environmental toxins. And of course, the cells die. But then, when we treated them first with coenzyme Q10 or with other substances, and then expose them to the same toxins, the cells survive. So this is a mind-boggling technology. Not if that, this is the future. If that works, imagine you, uh, you have many other diseases. You take a piece of skin, you engineer those skins into the induced pluripotent cells, and you create heart muscle, or you create the muscles, and you inject that your own cells, engineered cells, healthy ones, to the human body, and they're coming from you and going back to you. So that will be the future, and I think that this technology will uh, caught up, uh, will take some time, uh, but it definitely uh, will caught up. I would like to thank many of my patients that I had opportunity to work uh, in this country and actually around the globe, and many of my collaborators, including Dr. Schopner, who recently published a paper found a genetic mutation in one of the genes. And also I would like to thank uh, NINDS uh, and other foundations, including um, the Bolch family uh, from Atlanta, that sponsored uh, the research that, that I, you know, my team and Mayo Clinic is doing. So thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Zolek, you have me very excited about the future. 